Awesome. Well, Grant, it's uh, I'm so happy to be able to chat with you. I mean, after reading three of someone's book, it's kind of uh, mesmerizing to have them here right in front of you um, to be able to ask some questions directly. And, uh, you know, you've created great value to your community um, all while working at your own uh, career and and <laughs> providing for yourself with uh, alternate ways. And, uh, you know, I, I find that uh, pretty honorable. And so uh, right. it's an thank honor you. to be able to uh, to chat with you today. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm wondering now, after nearly ten years, um, what where you stand on on vitamin A and um, its metabolites in, in one of your books. I think you alluded it to it being rather than a vitamin that it was more of a hormone. Is is that a well, good characterization? Yeah, it is absolutely a hormone. So, you know, I think the medical definition of a hormone, anything that has um, kind of a signaling uh, capability to it, you know, from, you know, one cell to another to, you know, single some uh, process, um, you know, exchange of, of, you know, chemical signals. So, you know, definitely vitamin A is, is, is definitely doing that. Uh, I guess the assumption in the medical literature is, you know, the activity of vitamin A is, um, you know, well-documented, kind of, you know, probably one of the most researched molecules in all of medical science. And the assumption is all this biological activity is the result of its, you know, vitamin factor. Well, no, in my opinion, you know, all the biological activity is um, representing, you know, a toxicity and the outcome of a toxicity. So the cells become, um, you know, poisoned by vitamin A. I can talk more about exactly the mechanism of that. Sure, there's signaling going on because, um, you know, one of the key fundamental um, claims of vitamin A is it um, modifies gene expressions, and those gene expressions, of course, are measured by the uh, different proteins that a cell is generating, and it's like 500 different proteins proteins that are generated based on interaction with vitamin A or its active form, um, retinoic acid. And of course, those, those proteins that are produced by the cell are signaling other processes. You know, one, of course, is, you know, the autoimmune response. So yeah, you know, definitely it's, it's correct to categorize it as a hormone. Yes. And what I found really interesting, and you've brought in so much light to the topic of immune and, and immunologic dysfunction, and you even referred to it in your book as you wanted to drop the auto uh, word from the immune debate. And I know like you, we always commonly refer to it as autoimmune, but you, you, you had this little recharacterization that really shifted my perspective on how we approach immune dysfunction and how we kind of we throw the auto label on it and your whole book just goes on you know it it really glorifies our cell biology in a way that is more respectful of our own body like you have this outlook on the human body that is um you believe the the human body is far far more intelligent than we think it is and that it, it wouldn't just like simply attack itself could you could you enlighten us as to how you arrive to these uh, conclusions or maybe shed some new light on that? Sure. Um, I don't know if it's new light, but I'll kind of try to kind of explain kind of the fundamental thinking. So there's you know two observ observations that I made when I was starting to, you know, write those those ebooks. And, uh, you know, I didn't do a whole lot of research, I got to admit, but it's, you know, some glaring kind of fundamental truths come to light. One is that the rate of increase in, you know, most chronic diseases is, you know, almost exponential in North America. And um, the second observation is that there's big regional differences in these uh, diseases. And I was quite heavily focused on, quote, the autoimmune diseases as you've described because I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. And, uh, so I was, you know, interested to understand, you know, what's actually going on here. But with the fundamental understanding that there's been an exponential growth in, um, you know, not only autoimmune, autoimmune diseases, but many diseases in North America, and also the big regional differences, 
um, you can very quickly deduce that these diseases are, are indeed due to a, a poisoning. I, I use the word poisoning, and I don't like to use that word because some people think I'm trying to be dramatic. Well, I'm not, but it's just fundamentally, okay, this is a poisoning. It's a long-term, slow poisoning, very, very gradual you know, uh, accumulation of a toxin over time manifesting itself in, in disease. So that's the fundamental core premise, uh, fundamental core understanding of what's going on with the chronic diseases. And so by the medical community um, putting the title um, of autoimmunity on so many of these diseases is a complete misnomer. And it's also, I think, quite disrespectful to the complexity and kind of you know the, the awesomeness of, of the human body because the human body would never do that and as a matter of fact has never really done that in the last you know tens of thousands of years and it's just you know all of a sudden recently in the 20th century we have autoimmune diseases so um you know I, right away i wasn't buying the argument that these are so-called autoimmune diseases and um yeah, I you know, firmly believe that the body's not so foolish that the immune system is going to start attacking our own body and attacking our cell, own cells and, you know, errantly, um, you know, killing our own tissues. It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, so, you know, then once you understand the mechanism of what vitamin A is doing to a cell, uh, you completely um, should understand, you know, the the wrongly attributed autoimmunity because it's not it's not auto one it's you know it's not self-immunity it's actually immunity to a foreign protein or a foreign species appearing protein and it's not auto in the sense that it's happening automatically the immune system is doing exactly what it's been um, designed to do and that's you know attack cells that have you know appear to be infected by some you know, foreign organism or some yeah. uh, defective tissue, some defective um, molecule that's e encouraging it to behave incorrectly. So the immune system's working perfectly. And then, yeah. Anyway, that's it's, that's it's fine. yeah. Um, it's it clear, essentially, just clearing damaged cells and tagging them for excretion. And I, I, I could imagine in the. Um, you know, the explosion of chronic fatigue in the population, that we just have a growing number of damaged cells in our body on average, and our energy levels are dropping due to just massive clearance. I mean, I think we're also getting less energy from our, our food now because of the disturbance to soils and such, but I mean, like, the, the whole, like, and there seems to be a lot of uh, references to mineral deficiencies and i know you're doing some research on uh the compound or the the herbicide glyphosate um is there anything perhaps you're not allowed to share with us or a, a new book that you're releasing or some kind of thing it is a research topic of mine that i'm interested in i i do have some very specific things that i'm that i'm looking at in that regard but it's too early for me to kind of share anything there um um you know that's you know maybe you know a year or two out um but I, you know I'm, I'm not really kind of so much focused on glyphosate as from the human toxicity uh side i'm more concerned about it from the environmental side um but also i do believe that you know this is you know another toxin is not going to do anybody any good by having it in our in our food um just, you know, one comment on chronic fatigue, I think I've got a reasonable understanding of, you know, what is happening there, uh, you know, definitely related to, um, you know, toxicity state, uh, but also it's, it's more complicated. It's not just, uh, you know, an immune response. It's, um, it, it's, it's, I believe it's tied into, you know, insulin, insulin resistance. And there's kind of an interesting connection there with, with vitamin A and, and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. Perhaps in, in how uh, vitamin A does damage to the, the mitochondria and, and how you've detailed that in your book? Well, that's part of it. Uh, the second part of it is, um, you know, uh, 
what happens with vitamin A, kind of the fundamental thing that's, you know, kind of wrong with, with vitamin A, it uh, binds to both RNA and DNA. And once it does that, um, so you have to understand that, you know, DNA, RNA, you know, these are the, you know, the genetic blueprints for producing a protein. And so uh, when the cell takes that RNA, whether it's been incorrectly uh, transcribed from DNA due to a vitamin A molecule bonded into the, into the DNA molecule or bonded to the RNA molecule, when the ribosome produces a protein, it's now a defective protein because the template is wrong. The template has um, this foreign molecule stuck into it somewhere. And so when it generates a protein, it's now a defective protein. It may be partially correct or mostly correct, but most certainly not entirely correct, or it could be entirely you know, flawed and broken. Um, now, when the cell is producing um, insulin receptors, those are proteins that the cell needs to manufacture to bring protein or bring uh, glucose into the cell. So when the cell's producing um, improperly structured insulin receptors, you're not going to be getting insulin into the cell, and you're not getting insulin into the cell, you're not getting glucose into the cell, and yes, you're going to suffer chronic fatigue. And um, of course, you know, something, you know, probably most people do know, but maybe some people um, don't appreciate, you know, there's trillions of cells in the human body, there's, you know, thousands of mitochondria in, in a cell, and it takes a long, long time to, you know, poison all of these uh, or a sufficient number of these these structures to manifest in disease. So if, you know, obviously somebody listening to this might say, well, this can't be right because I, you know, I have vitamin A in all my food and I maybe even have taken a supplement and, you know, I haven't gotten sick. Well, no, it, it takes time. So this is a very long, slow process over decades, this slow kind of picking away at, you know, the DNA uh, structures of your cells, you know, and the mitochondria, and eventually kind of builds up and you have um, improperly structured proteins of all kinds, including insulin receptors. And that's why people become insulin resistant and not able to you know, properly uh, process glucose. And with that comes chronic fatigue. There's more to it, but that's kind of in a nutshell. And so, what do you think is the, if we were to create the context in someone's body to make the same dosage of vitamin A more toxic, what do you think some of those things would be? Okay, yeah. so, um, well, the most well documented is, you know, what your dietary mix looks like in any single meal. So if you have, let's say a high vitamin A content uh, plant food with very little uh, fat or oil, well, not much of that's going to be absorbed. So if you had a big plate of spinach with no fat or oil, you know, it's like a small percentage of that, uh, oh, they're carotenoids, but it's a vitamin A precursor, but a small percentage of that's going to be absorbed. So if you have, let's say, you know, a bowl of spinach with some, you know, cheese or some other oils, well, all of a sudden your intake just went dramatically higher. Um, so that that combination makes it makes it worse. Um, and then some foods are just inherently really bad, uh, in my opinion, uh, like the seed oils, and especially things like canola oil, because these oils already have uh, the vitamin A, and, and once again, it's per, uh, carotenoid, but uh, pre-emulsified in, in the fat and the oil. So when you uh, consume that, your uh, percent uptake of it is is very high as opposed to if you had it, you know, without uh, being pre-emulsified into an oil. Things like uh, Canadian dairy, where, you know, milk is fortified with vitamin A palmitate, uh, margarine in Canada fortified with vitamin A palmitate. So this is a vitamin A molecule that's uh, esterified with uh, palmitic acid, and the uptake is going to be be high. So it's it, it's tricky because there's a lot of different variables, and you know that that you know um, from the perspective of you know dietary intake, th th those are some of the factors. Um, but what people need to understand is once again, you know, this is a slow accumulation. Uh, 
over time, and you know most of it's accumulating in your liver. And any, uh, you know, as you get older, you know, let's say in your 30s or, you know, older, um, you know, any stressful event, just, you know, psychological stress, physical stress can cause a significant release of vitamin A into serum. Um, high levels of endurance exercise, like maybe you start running or something and all, you know, a few weeks later, you don't feel so great anymore, you know, contrary to what you think, because you've been, you know, increasing your physical uh, uh activity but also at the same time you'll be circulating more vitamin a into serum so it uh you know a lot of people have reported that you know if they've taken on a new exercise regimen that oh you know all of a sudden they're not feeling so well a few weeks later so that would explain it um exposure to cold weather um and just you know, lots of things that can cause a surge in the release of vitamin a from um endogenous vitamin a from your liver do you think there there's also an issue with retinoic acid increasing reactive oxygen species as well as it like I know you you talk a lot about the protein binding and and how that that damages the RNA and such but but do you think there's also that effect of reactive oxygen species I haven't looked in that looked at that in in a great detail um Probably, um, that's just my speculation on it, though I don't have any kind of hard evidence to, to say one way or the other. What effect does it have, like a retinoic acid or retinol circulating in blood versus it being bound up in, in retinol binding protein? Yeah, well, okay, so it's, you know, officially, well, both retinol and retinoic acid, of course, um, are documented to be, you know, too toxic to be in serum, you know, unprotected or un, unbound. So um, retinol or retinoic acid circulating in blood is going to very, very quickly uh, get absorbed into cells. One study I've read, it was about down to one millisecond. So um, it's probably very little free retinol or free retinoic acid, you know, circulating in blood, depending on what you know, someone's current state of health is. Uh, from the literature, I think it's 95% uh, or more of retinols actually uh, tied up in the retinol binding proteins, which I view as, as antibodies. Um, and then, you know, once it gets into the cell, yeah, there's, there's binding proteins, um, uh, nucleic uh, binding proteins that will, will transport it, you know, internally in the cell. So for the most part, you know, they're both, um, you know, bound up pretty quickly to, to some other molecule. I was always looking into increasing retinol binding protein um, for the safe trafficking and excretion of vitamin A. I bumped into a lot of research on copper, zinc, and manganese, all appearing to be essential for creating stable retinol binding protein so like perhaps you could be taking in enough uh, zinc but then if there's missing manganese or copper then then the the protein itself might not be stable enough to carry that retinol and the uh, and and there could be uncontrolled release of it or um, just it's simply not being metabolized correctly that could be i i, I would uh, be very cautious about the copper. I, I personally, I don't remember coming across any, you know, literature that says the copper was essential. You know, zinc would definitely be. Uh, manganese, I, I believe that's that's correct. You know, something else that you know is in the literature is taurine. Um, so, um, you know, those taurine, zinc, and manganese would be, you know, probably, you know, interesting supplements someone could take. Um, would you say uh, the reason why so many communities have such adverse reactions to copper is simply because they're so overburdened with vitamin A? I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of suspect that copper is, you know, well, it's known by itself to be, you know, quite toxic. So, um, you know, <laughs> very concerned about toxicity. So I'd be very reluctant to just kind of, you know, take it on face value that it's beneficial.
Right. Well, in the in the context of the mitochondria and the the fourth complex of the electron transport chain, copper does have some essentials, but it's it's to be gauged whether like again, what's what's the RDA for it? What can we truly appreciate and what amount in it would be useful? We know the the RDA for vitamin A in, in many countries at 3000 IUs is, is quite absurdly high. Um, but uh, even in the case of copper, I, I know uh, uh, Jason Homel has uh, bumped into you. Um, and we have an interesting circle. I mean, I think you're part of an interesting circle of people who have who are coming to things from different perspectives. But altogether, your perspectives as a whole create this balanced uh, picture. So I would say between uh, Morley Robbins and Grant General, you're kind of two very opposing um, uh, characters in a way. And Jason Homel kind of comes in the middle here as also kind of, you know, proclaiming vitamin A toxicity. And then uh, we have also Mr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Smith, um, also proclaiming vitamin A toxicity, uh, but also proclaiming copper to be nothing but toxic and, and not seeming to want to discuss any of its essential um, capacities in uh, the enzyme such as lysol oxidase, right? So I mean, you, you, copper in some contexts can be an oxidant, a prooxidant, but in some contexts it can be an antioxidant. We know uh, iron is is quite a damaging uh, heavy metal when it's in high concentrations in the body, and and you know liver toxicity and, and such, and and many other organ toxicities. And high iron impairs the function of copper. Uh, it impairs the function of manganese. So, I mean, if if you're already toxic in iron. Um, free-flowing copper into the body in inappropriately high doses could could cause a severe adverse reaction because the body won't be able to use it. The the context is is incorrect, and so between the five of you or the four of you, Jason Grant, Doctor Smith, and Morley Robbins, you all bring an interesting thing to the picture. Although I'm I am quite cautious with Morley as he's recommending people take cod liver oil, and uh, I don't think many people are going to have a beneficial experience with that. Yeah, I you know I, I know these names, but I don't know these you know I don't know these individuals. I I've never spoken to Morley. Uh, I think Jason maybe and I, him and I have exchanged a few emails, but uh, so I really don't know these other these other um, folks you know much at all or kind of what the position is on you know toxic copper or not um i do know dr smith's position on it um i've done a bit of my own kind of you know quote research on it but not more than probably you know four hours kind of thing but i've come to the you know conclusion that you know like anything else right you've got to be super careful with with any of these supplements and um you know copper uh it doesn't, you know, I, I would be very careful with it. Yeah. And I think, I think you bring a very profound wisdom to the table in the fact that in your experience, you took a very careful and considerate approach and uh, wisely detoxified vitamin A very slowly over many, many years um, many aren't as patient as you are, and uh, many, I believe, are can do damage in in rushing detoxification and and uh, boosting detox pathways. But I think the more knowledge we have, uh, the more we can come to a faster way to detoxify um, vitamin A um, in a time frame that you know maybe someone doesn't have ten years. Um, to do, although I think you you did do most, you did pretty well even just with one year. Um, I think most of your immune problems cleared up after two or one or two years. Am, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that, that's about correct. Yeah, 
Uh, so I was kind of through the worst of it in the first year. I guess, you know, at least I knew I might not die. Uh, and then kind of the second and third year, you know, once again, kind of, well, let's, let me say it this way. Probably in the first year, I made a, you know, let's say, you know, 60% recovering my health, which was huge because of coming off complete rock bottom. And then in the following two years, let's say about kind of 10% each. And then for the next five years, kind of, you know, a, five, a few percentages kind of each year improvement in my health. So, uh, yes, I was patient, I suppose. Uh, I was careful because I didn't want to kind of risk anything. Um, and yeah, I would like, you know, like anybody else, I'd like to find a way to make this faster and safer, obviously. Um, I really, at this point in time, do not have any good suggestions, uh, you know, what people can do to make it, quote, faster and safer. Um, you know, we've got kind of the, you know, the, you know, the, kind of, you know, the basic, um, I'm going to call them supplements that people can use to hopefully improve things. I think, you know, zinc is at kind of the top of the list. Um, taurine is, a lot of people have tried it. You know, the results are quite varied. Um, so it, it's it's a potential, you know. Taurine is quite a powerful bile conjugate. And uh, I know some bile ducts and intestinal barrier aren't quite up to the task of of getting that much bile in there yet so i I, but i still believe taurine is a really important part of the picture and i I mean beef and rice or bison and, and and rice seems to provide quite a bit of taurine but i there's a lot of people that i don't think are willing to eat a pound of beef a day or or more and so yeah, taking taking the supplement is an interesting an interesting route. Um, you know, a lot of people are using activated charcoal. I think reasonably successfully. Um, you know, manganese. I'm not sure about. Of course, you know, there's potassium. Um, so there's there's those kind of staple kind of you know basic things. Um, I've been making uh, pretty regular uh, plasma donations, which I think are helpful. You know. Um, so there, there is, you know, certain things that people can do to try to kind of make the process, you know, faster and safer, I uh, suppose. And, you know, maybe we should just have a comment about kind of the safety of this too, because um, uh, I have a separate blog post uh, entirely on what I call the, you know, tackling the deep talks setback trap. And, you know, what, what happens is, is people take on an uh, abruptly take on a very low vitamin A diet, like going down to, you know, like what you've described, trying to go down to a zero uh, vitamin A intake diet. What happens is the liver starts to detoxify itself and more vitamin A gets um, brought into circulation and you come sicker than what you've started at. And that's, you know, obviously um, not something we want to see happen. So, um, you know, there's the question is like how low should somebody go on their vitamin a and going cold turkey and you know abruptly stopping all intake is maybe not the best strategy especially for maybe people that are older kind of you know gradually weaning yourself down to a smaller intake might be safer uh, unfortunately you know we're a small community we don't have you know a lot of data on kind of what the optimal strategy is and it's going to vary from person to person so it's really kind of hard to nail down Mm-hmm. Yeah, slowly. I, I did end up, before I go and went down to about zero, that was about three months ago, or close to zero. And But about a year before that, I had stopped eating like dark leafy green vegetables, um, no seed oils, uh, and the like, just kind of meat and fruit. Uh, I didn't really touch liver. I had liver maybe a couple times uh, in that time. But a year before that, I had had a, a couple cans of cod liver oil and I had taken some retinol palmitate for about the span of a few weeks. And I think that's where I ran into some exercise intolerance. Um, so that might, might have been the peak toxicity around a, about a year and a half ago, a year and a few months ago. Um, fortunately, uh, I ran into your books and at my age was was able to kind of turn that around and uh, prevent further um, 
toxicity and and uh, you know, one less toxin in a life and it's a pretty big one a, quite a significant one and uh, I, I liked how in the context of the book you went over Atlantic Canada and magical reversal of Crohn's and Alzheimer's disease in that uh, in 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 the East Coast and it was it was interesting you think you think the cod there's there's also a connection with mercury there as well I, no i think it's like if you know the history of canada and you know I, i've gone through the stats from stats canada on the regional health disparities and you know it's kind of funny when i was um in university you know in the early 1980s it was kind of well known in canada that you know halifax or you know the scotia was you know i've heard it described as kind of i don't want to i don't want to repeat it but anyway you know a much higher rate of disease than the rest of the country and nobody nobody understood why so i think it was kind of even just kind of among the general public never mind the medical community that you know the health disparities in that region of canada were unusually high and so i no i don't think it's mercury um you know back then we wouldn't have had nearly as much mercury in the oceans as we do now so no i think it's, it's strictly vitamin a not not that mercury is good or um you know not not to give it a pass either i think it's you know obviously extremely toxic you don't want to have any mercury but uh i think that disparity in health that happened in, in atlantic canada with the closing of the cod fishery in 93 was it was due to vitamin a intake hmm. uh, so jason humel um who wrote the copper revolution healing with minerals uh, spoke a great deal about about copper but the broader premise of his book was that as a population we're broadly mineral deficient and that to be able to um, keep the body at high enough purity and be able to eliminate enough vitamin a that we need a certain status of of mineral proficiency uh, to be able to run a, a lot of the key enzymes and he speaks a lot about connective tissue and how, you know, upwards of 30% of our body is made of connective tissue. And, you know, the primary route of excretion for vitamin A is, is through the, the bile in, in the liver and uh, out through the gut. But there's so much bile reabsorption happening and, and just vitamin A being reabsorbed that it, it's almost like an endless loop and it becomes more and more difficult to detoxify vitamin a as the gut barrier continues to break down and the bile ducts continue to break down and so where i'm seeing the connection between the two of you is that running these key enzymes like lysyl oxidase that rebuilds uh, collagenous tissues with collagen um that requires copper, zinc, uh, manganese, and uh, a little bit of some sort of antioxidant to function well, right? Because it's lysyl oxidase, so it's it's oxidizing it part in the chemical reaction where it's creating collagenous tissues. It's it's creating you know it's it's oxidizing an area of the body, and we need a um, an antioxidant to come in and clean up after it kind of, you know, it's like kind of a, a welder comes in and, uh, you know, or, you know, whatever the, the metabolites or the byproducts of creating something, you, you always have some sort of toxin. These, these key enzymes really need minerals, uh, to be able to function so that we can, uh, keep our bile ducts healthy so that the liver doesn't just repoison itself with vitamin A um and bile leakage and and such and so copper manganese and and uh, zinc and uh, some vitamin c these four are really essential for rebuilding the collagenous tissues and it can take years to uh, kind of remineralize the body it, um, some studies who was looking at rat and mice studies it took three generations for the the mice and the and the rats to become deficient and 
it, and you know perhaps we've only have glyphosate around for for so long but there are other things and other pesticides that have been killing the earthworms that you know dig up the the holes and aerate the the soil so that the mycorrhizal fungi can can naturally bring the minerals up from the depths of the soil to the root systems of the plants and so we're seeing we're deficient in pretty much all of the trace minerals um you know, I, I've not really looked at that at all. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the whole disease causation um, research from, you know, the perspective of toxicity. And uh, so I think, you know, one of the things that's gotten us into all this trouble with, with vitamin A and some other vitamins is this whole notion of a deficiency. And, you know, I think uh, the human body is incredibly, you know, well designed to you know live in a you know in a quite a low food intake environment you know uh so you know this theory that you know it's the mineral deficiency that's causing the disease uh, i you know, have a really hard time buying that uh now there may be a lot of merit to you know minerals helping us get out of this uh toxicity state faster so i'm not uh, at all kind of um dispelling that notion but you know, for me um you know, disease causation is, you know, like I said, these two very fundamental things. You look at the regional differences and the exponential growth rates, and you look at those things, you, you know, these are, you know, there's just no question that these are toxicity conditions. And, you know, there's just, you know, for, uh, anyway. You know. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. And it, it does make sense that um, vitamin A being a much larger tree trunk of the whole disease causation thing, you know, it, it rings out and it makes sense because, you know, we see an increase in vegetable consumption over the last 50 years, right? And animal products essentially haven't grown. So we're just, we're eating so much more beta, we're eating so much more carotenoids and getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And so we, we really kind of messed up on the whole uh, establishing an RDA for A and figuring out, okay, um, you know, how much do we really need? It, it seems like it, it does have some very limited functions, but from my research, it seems to be more so of a backup nutrient slash steroid slash hormone that we don't really need. And, you know, if we can just do the basics, we don't need to throw steroids into the system to increase stem cell differentiation i mean that's complete uh that whole you know theory of stem cell differentiation is complete bullshit uh pardon my french but um you know that that's complete nonsense and the claim is that you know this is an essential vitamin you need it for stem cell differentiation and proliferation and you know um you know all these kind of other you know essential body functions um maintaining your epithelial tissues and everything else well look at me here i am 10 years later virtually 10 years later with no vitamin a in my diet i have none of those 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 problems so um you know obviously my stem cells are able to differentiate just fine without vitamin a and that's mm -hmm. kind of one of the premises in science you know you only need one um uh experiment to disprove a theory you know you need a lot of of repeatable experiments to prove the theory but you only need one to disprove it and uh you know after 10 years i think i'm still a human being i'm still alive complete nonsense that we need vitamin a for anything in the human body that's my yeah. position on it i mean yeah, actually, your, your skin uh, appears I'm, to be really healthy uh my skin is 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 good you know it's smooth and you know i'm 64 years old and uh um you know, the strongest I've been in my adult life, uh, just, you know, lots of things are, you know, the best they've been in two decades for me. You know, I came from, you know, near death with a, a terminal prognosis with, um, you know, end stage kidney disease that I've recovered from. Um, so, you know, just nobody can tell me that this is an essential vitamin. It's, it's complete nonsense. And, you know, back to your point about, you know, we're eating, you know, more vegetables. Well, I think we're eating a lot more of everything in, in this, um, um, in this decade than we were ever in human history. And secondly, and most importantly, maybe most importantly, 
this was legislated into the food supply in North America, well, actually around the world in, you know, 1972, 74. And if you look at the charts of chronic disease, a real, you know, uh, hockey stick exponential growth on uh, the chronic diseases happened in about kind of the late 1970s, 19, you know, early 1980s, and then kind of this exponential growth going up from there, completely coinciding with um, vitamin A being, you know, legislated into, um, you know, the food supply, you know, North America, it's in dairy, um, in Canada, um, and uh, products like margarine in the United States is even worse because it's not only in their dairy, it's in their in a lot of their uh, flour-based products, you know, breads, breakfast cereals. So kind of a double whammy. So yeah, of course, everybody's getting sick. This is a highly toxic molecule that accumulates over time. Yeah, no, the, the connection, especially to chronic kidney disease is extremely clear. Um, and you, as you pointed out as well in your book, uh, that retinol uh, esterified to palmitic acid, palm oil, um, how exactly does that make it water soluble and go straight to the kidneys? Can you describe that? Well, you know, the actual chemistry and how it makes it water soluble. Um, you know, it's, you know, vitamin A, you know, not bound to uh, an ester like, you know, palmitic acid is, you know, hydrophilic. It, it you know, expels water. So, um, yeah, it's bound to. Uh, vitamin A palmitate, uh, my belief is the reason that was done so that it would emulsify and distribute in, in dairy products properly. So, you know, without that, you would have in, any vitamin A added to dairy, you know, flo- you know, quickly floating up or settling out to the, you know, the, the top of the, of, the, of the container. So that was probably done to have it emulsify and distribute through it. Um, uh, whether or not, you know, I don't really kind of, I'd have to think about kind of the, you know, the chemical, um, you know, affinity between, you know, H2O and, and palmitic acid, but it, it is documented. It, it, it does make it uh, water soluble. So that, that it's, that's just a, you know, a fact. Yeah. And so that retinol palmitates, it's essentially supplemented and it's also put in a lot of dairy in specifically NATO countries. It's interesting that you pointed out the NATO countries in the book. It's just it's weird. It's all. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I did look at that, and you know, there's kind of um, this kind of blanket agreement, I guess. I don't know if it's kind of you know directly aligned to you know most of the NATO countries, but things like the CDC and the FDA, when those organizations in the United States make a decision, they are automatically adopted in Canada and I'm assuming other NATO countries. So they have kind of this um, this regulatory authority to. Uh, set the standards, not just the United States, but in all these other countries too that are uh, bound by these these you know bilateral agreements, whether it's NATO or other kind of trade agreements. So you know what what goes on in the United States happens in these other countries too. So interesting. Um, my last question is on uh, testosterone and, and fertility. Um, and so, you know, a lot of interesting things there, um, lots of people decreeing that it's essential for testosterone. Uh, I mean, again, it, it, it appears to be a steroid. Um, but what, what do you have to kind of disprove this whole theory of it being required for fertility and uh, testosterone? Um, I really not haven't looked at the testosterone uh, connection much. I know Garrett Smith had put together a long, um, you know, presentation on that specific topic, but I'll talk about fertility. Um, so uh, in the 1940s, there's, you know, 1940s, there was uh, these studies by Rodal, which was, I think, in Sweden or Denmark. And he was looking at the toxicity of vitamin A in, you know, several different um, animals. Uh, he did, um, I think it was in cocker spaniels, um, chickens, and um, quite a few different animals. And, you know, s- specifically zeroed in on just how incredibly this, to- this vitamin A was to um, fertility in these animals, just decimates their fertilities at, at high doses. 
Um, so those studies by Rodal are a really good resource, and it's um, you know several hundred pages in in uh, his studies. Probably, yeah, probably you know several hundred pages of documentation on what happens to each species as they're exposed to uh, excessive amounts of vitamin A. Then there was another study uh, done in the 1960s. I want to say the University of Wisconsin uh, was done on on young pigs and also, uh, you know, specifically looking at what happens uh, to, you know, male pigs exposed to, you know, high doses of vitamin A just decimates them um, from a fertility uh, perspective. Then, of course, um, there's a well-known, quote, side effect from Accutane, um, you know, basically, you know, chemically castrating, you know, thousands of young men. So anybody that claims that vitamin A is needed for fertility uh, needs to go do their, their reading because um, they're completely wrong. Absolutely completely wrong. This is the worst, worst, you know, chemical, one of the worst chemicals, you know, a male can have on their body for fertility and women too. Well, possibly also damaging the DNA for their children as well, right? And could be. Yeah, it sure could be. You, you know, why not? Because that's exactly what vitamin A does. It damages DNA. Um uh, but, you know, just so you know, in, in the medical literature, vitamin A is documented as a fertility toxin. That's that's not speculation. That's, you know, clearly stated. It's a fertility toxin. Yeah. And birth defects. It, it blows my mind that it's put in prenatals. Uh, I, 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 I ended up making a custom prenatal for my wife just so that I could have something without vitamin a because uh, it was everywhere I, I it's everywhere and in in these uh, baby formulas too it's unbelievable some of the concentrations are just when you do the ratio uh of the body weights um so let's say the rda in north america i don't know i think it's let's say it's three i think it's three thousand i use today but if you do the ratios on the the dose that's being given to uh infants with infant formulas it's like 10x not not in all of them, but several. You know, there's some that are even you know much higher. Like so, an infant is getting you know quote you know 10x the RDA based on um, you know some of the the uh, concentrations that are in infant formula. So infant formulas are are a disaster for child health, in my opinion. You know, it's mm-hmm. probably the reason though it's kind of well known in you know medical community and just in general that breastfeeding is so much uh, more beneficial for children than uh, than formula. Well, I think it's obviously well, you know, one of the huge factors is the the ridiculous uh, high concentration of vitamin A in, in formulas. Mm-hmm. Especially if uh, if a mother maybe undertakes a lower vitamin A diet uh, during gestation and and breastfeeding, then even the a mother's breast milk will be lower in vitamin A as well. Yeah, uh, in, in, in theory, but it takes a long time, right? So it, it depends on, you know, how much in advance if she's taken on that low vitamin A diet. But yeah, um, it, and I think, you know, maintaining a low vitamin A diet, you know, while you're breastfeeding is very, very smart to be very prudent. But, you know, once again, you know, this is a, uh, this is a, a theory that's can completely you know contradicts you know mainstream um medicine mainstream thinking on this topic so you know people have to do their their own research and their own thinking and come to their own conclusions i mean the most i would give them is it's some sort of backup nutrient or dangerous steroid (laughs) i wouldn't give them anything actually um (laughs) no i i you know i've um in my books i kind of had the position where, you know, okay, this is likely just botch science, right? This is just botch science. And maybe, maybe somebody decided to take advantage of this botch science. Uh, my thinking has shifted now where I'm thinking, you know, this is quite possibly and even quite highly likely uh, deliberate. This is probably not a mistake. Yeah, like if you were in the 1% and climate change was on the way, and you needed some way to depopulate the planet, perhaps <laughs> to put something in their food supply that might impact fertility or slow things down. But this was exactly documented, right? This, uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen, you know, the release of the, this Kissinger paper 
that was published in coincidentally 1972 um you know secret um classified document just you know declassified uh, a few years ago like two or three years ago and it's kind of 50 year anniversary and that's that's stated explicitly in in the kissinger um uh, plan for kind of an emergency response to global population growth and, you know, stated that they needed to add something to the world's food supply. They needed to do it regional. So there would be regional acceptance of it, you know, regional meaning uh, to, to match regional dietary preferences, like in North America is added to milk and, and, and dairy because, you know, we have that consumption here. In South America was added to sugar, Southeast Asia was added to MSG, it's being added to golden rice throughout you know southeast asia uh it seems like you know pretty strong coincidence right i mean <laughs> it doesn't sound like anyone's really deficient in the thing but whatever they're doing with all of this it seems like it's working i mean testosterone has been more than cut in half and yeah uh, and iq's iq's also IQ has dropped, uh, I think, 20% since the 1970s. You think of, you know, a 20% drop in IQ. Like, how alarming is that? Um, but probably, you know, most of your listeners don't know that. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. I've put together a website, and one of my pages uh, I discuss, uh, and I link to your website, and I I go over some foods that are high in vitamin A, and I try and, uh, distinguish some of the foods that are lower in it. Just so I, and I I put together a kind of a food plan that um, doesn't have any food that's maybe over t- thirty IU's per one hundred grams. Um, and yeah, I thought it might be interesting. Um, and and maybe you could, uh, if you were interested, go over it and give me some feedback. Just kind of on the page as well in general. I go over a lot of different uh, minerals and enzymes and uh, some mechanisms of, of uh, trying to safely keep vitamin A bound up in the liver or just excrete it. And uh, yeah, I would be interested in your feedback and uh, any yeah, further discussion sure, yeah. to, upon your availability. And, yeah, uh, share that link with me and I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. And I think, you know, you know, for me to take on this diet, um, I had no problem with it, but I'm a bit of a strange cat in a way because, you know, I can, I can do extreme things and, you know, I, it doesn't bother me. I'm not a food person. So having this extremely limited diet didn't bother me one tiny bit. As a matter of fact, I found it quite, um, um, quite convenient. Um, now, but people shouldn't try to mimic my diet, right? I, I went to extreme vitamin A. Um, or elimination of vitamin A, because I wanted to prove a scientific point. I wanted to prove a human can live without this in their diet in for, you know, for 10 years kind of thing. And so I'm getting really close to proving that point. But other people sh- don't need to go to that extreme, right? So we've got this long human history of people living to be 100 years or older. And they did that on a reasonably um, low vitamin A diet. They don't need to go to an extreme, you know, vitamin a elimination diet like what i've done so i think if people are just aware of the big ticket items stay away from the big ticket items don't do anything really foolish um you know repeatedly i suppose um they're going to be just fine so you don't need to you know worry about every single little iu of vitamin a like a a reasonable amount is your body's well adapted to deal with it and you know deal with it over a long term also right so um i wouldn't be so concerned about you know, the, you know, the, you know, trying to eliminate it all because one, you can't do that. And two, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's going to be way too restrictive for most people. Right. Yeah. I have another plan as well. That's, um, less restrictive and does allow for some, um, foods that might be higher in vitamin A as well. And, uh, always looking around trying to, um, build something that's going to be more diverse, but, uh, but uh, I, I like the idea and I know like how many people like have vitamin A toxicity symptoms. It's like too many to count. It's, it's just too many to count. And so, I mean, if there, if we can create maybe several different entry points, at least that will be better than, you know, whatever is being done. So, I, I mean, I might create a third, you know, just like 
so at least you know it's something that could be more broadly adopted um but i, I think uh you know beef and rice for some people you know it's, it like you said can be quite freeing it's pretty easy you kind of just you know pressure cook or parboil a bunch of rice and and you kind of cook a roast and uh interesting yeah very convenient yeah so nathaniel are you doing coaching are you is that what you're kind of planning to do here you're you're going to be coaching people on on are you you know planning to be like a I'm, coach or something? i'm or thinking you... about it uh, doing it okay. maybe perhaps a little bit on the side on just the down low for now um i have a, a number of things to tend to but i i think it'd be uh, I think it'd be really interesting to to do some of that, uh, but uh, you know, I'm working on a book. I'm uh, working on some other things, and you know, I, I think it's always important to be interacting face to face and and having direct uh, contact with with people and and doing at least a little bit of consulting, just for the experience of uh, of connecting with someone and humanizing kind of the process right because uh, it's so easy to become disconnected from from what you're doing when you don't have direct um human to human uh, interaction so it, it'll bring more insight to you know book writing and uh, uh blogs and and videos and so yeah like a uh, content creation book writing uh ho hopefully that kind of can kind of take on um, a bigger aspect of the of the job and then uh, consulting could be something just uh, just so that i could uh socialize and humanize myself a little bit no i understand okay well great yeah good luck to you i'm, I'm you know glad to hear there's another canadian you know interested in this topic uh <laughs> most of um the i'm gonna call you know people i i hear from are actually mostly from the united states so um, um yeah, good. Good to have a Canadian. We, there's obviously a, you know quite a few other Canadians now kind of participating in it. So, but uh, yeah, well, I should definitely um, input some of my data into your forum just so you have some more data in there. But I mean, it, it looks like you've kind of proven your point, but still interesting to have more data points. Yeah, you know, maybe I've been you know focus on other things for the last kind of year you know i've done i think three community surveys now maybe i'll put up another one just to kind of see where things are at um it's a little bit discouraging though because um you know we've got we you know there's been some good uh, success stories but generally you know people really it's just a long slow process to see recovery and i think the dropout rate is um I don't know what it is actually. I think, um, you know, obviously some people are, you know, they take this on, they get an improvement in their health and they move on with life. And that's exactly what should happen, right? They, you know, once you're, you're feeling better, you don't need to kind of, um, you know, kind of stick to this. And so dropout rate, but I think there's a certain line, well, I'm quite sure there's a certain percentage of people that drop out yeah. because they try it for, you know, two or three months or six months or whatever it is. They don't see any significant improvement in their health and say, okay, this is not for me. It's not working. You know, the theory is not valid. And for whatever reason, you know, they, they, they drop out. And that's very disappointing to me because, um, you know, we need to have, you know, much better, um, success rate, a higher degree of predictability and progress. And so we still have a long ways to go, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, well, it's a, an honor to speak with you. And I'm, uh, you know, glad uh, um, that, uh, you know, this whole hypothesis has worked out quite well for you. And thank uh, you. Yeah. To more, uh, to, to more successes. Uh, you know, it's great to see. Great. All okay. right. Thanks a lot. Nathaniel. We'll keep in touch. Awesome. Have a okay. great day. You too. Bye.